Good evening, good day, everybody, and welcome back to the Ask Abhijit Show. It's been a while since we did this. We are in episode one sixty seven, and today we're going to talk about Manipur, the Manipur crisis. I'm going to take uh, a bunch of questions that you asked, and hopefully that covers the entire gamut of issues and topics related to this matter. But before we do that, let's uh, go and see who all is there with us. Uh, who all is there on the live chat? Shala laughs, Norlax, the arcane, arcane self. Vishnu Mohan, Nishant, Ketan, Pinky Kumari, Chandana, Amit, Akhand Pratap Singh, Akshat, ARJ, Sushant, Global Stories, GK, <clears throat> Pragyesh, Siddharth, Sagapam, Towards Truth, Suresh Kumar, this is Rishant, Dhruv Kumar, DK, Vladimir Zelensky, Anvesh Jain, Obito, Geopolitical Dubey, Priyanshi Sood, Ari Sharma, Tathagat, Aditya, LinkedIn user, Amogha, Sur Pragyesh Lagerho online, Alpha Divya, the Bra OG1, Uncle Sam, Akash, Abhishek Pawar, Sanjit Kumar Gupta, Prasanna, Om Partha, Madhav Mukherjee, Rohit, the September Guy, Ketan Mankede, Gitu Parna, Om Bekhedikar, Somya Dikshit, Sur Dungar Singh Chauhan, Aditya Bhavani, uh, Alpha Anup, Brozen. Sneha, Prajwal, and lots and lots of other people. Thank you so much for being on the live stream. I will not be able to greet you all individually, but thank you so much for being here. And uh, with that said, let's talk about uh, Manipur. So I have deliberately kept quiet about Manipur for, for a very long time. The issue began in early May, 3rd of May. And I kept quiet about this because it's a sensitive matter. And now you have all kinds of stories on social media and YouTube and what, where, God knows where, with all kinds of narratives and interpretations about what's happening. Obviously, there's a lot of propaganda. Obviously, there's a lot of misinformation. So I think it's it's time now to, you know, set, set the matter right. Uh, when it comes to Manipur, you know, I have... I have been studying the history of Mongolia and Chinggis Khan since 1998. When it comes to Manipur, I've been studying Manipur since 1997. That's more than a quarter century. So I have some understanding of Manipur. And I have been there more than once. So I understand the place. I know the place. It's not like I'm, I, I've read a couple of articles and I'm, I'm uh, you know, <laughs> passing some judgment. Okay, so with that said, let us begin with the questions. Question number one is by Madhur Anjalekar. Anj, Madh, whatever, yeah. Uh, can you please explain the origin of Manipur? Like when and how was it established? And where does its school of thought belong to? Do shed some light on what's the reason behind the diversity of Manipur? Okay. First of all, let's see where Manipur is on the map. We have to have the map, right? So let's go to the maps and see where Manipur is in case some of us are not aware. It's possible because our education system completely ignores the Northeast. So we may not be aware of where it is. So this here is India, as we know. And if you go to the far east of India, we have what we call the Northeast. Why is it called the Northeast, by the way? It's because the British first established their foothold in Bengal of India which is present-day West Bengal and present-day Bangladesh, unified Bengal. The British first colonized that place. The Bengalis are the oldest colonized Indians when it comes to the British colonization. And from their perspective in Bengal, from the British perspective in Bengal, the region that we call the Northeast was to the Northeast of Bengal. So they call it the Northeast, the Northeastern territories or whatever. And afterwards, our historians, etc., you know, dutifully and slavishly kept on calling this region the Northeast, even though it is actually the Far East of India. It is the Northeast of Bengal, but the Far East of India. But we still call it the Northeast, even though it is not in the North East of India. It's in the Far East. So that's the first ridiculous thing and that we are still continuing. Even to the to the, the media, your, your teachers, your professors, your textbooks, they will all say the Northeast. It's not the Northeast. It's the Far East. <clears throat> so here you have Manipur. All right. And the capital of Manipur is the city of Imphal. Uh, so this is the state. Now, what's the origin of Manipur? So the origin of Manipur is not exactly known when it began. Manipuri culture, civilization, the people, the Manipuri people. Uh, 
according to some versions uh, the the manipur kingdom is about 2000 years old according to other versions it's at least 3 and 1/2000 years old what we can agree upon what all history textbooks before written before 2000 2000 will agree upon is that the kingdom of manipur is, is at least 2000 years old right and they have this uh, recorded lineage of kings and this royal chronicle is called the chetharol kumbhava uh so we know the history of manipur we know how old it is at least 2000 years old and let's go to the satellite image so as you can see it's it's all hills uh, manipur this region is in the foothills of the himalayas it's a very hilly place uh it's it's uh, heavily forested and there is uh, the the valley region which itself is a very high altitude region almost 900 meters above sea level the imphal valley region and the uh, state is a hill state so uh, about 2000 years ago or, or depending on what what perspective you see 2000 or 3 and a half thousand years ago the entire imphal valley region was uh, you know was was uh, uh the, it was under water essentially and then the water slowly receded and the first region in the valley that became dry is called the kangla which you will see deep inside imphal the kangla fort this is the uh, historical birthplace you could say of of, of the manipuri uh, kingdom so it's at least 2000 years old and this the kangla fort is the heartland or the birthplace so to say of the manipuri kingdom and manipuri culture and civilization so uh, let's understand the origin of manipur a little, little deeper so there is something i have i've spoken about this but let me say it again there is something called the manipuri language that is about 2000 years old at least everybody knows the manipuri language what it is it's the official state language of manipur it's around 2000 years old at least now the question is which is the ethnic group that is the originator of the manipuri language today in manipur there are three major ethnic groups the so called nagas the so called kukis and the maithes so of out of these three ethnic groups which ethnic group is the originator of the manipuri language the answer is the maithes not the nagas not the kukis it is the maithes um when it comes to the kings of manipur at least 2000 years of history recorded history of the kings of manipur they all belonged to just one ethnic group and that was again the maithes uh there is something called manipuri dance that is world famous it's one of the major dance forms of india uh, it you know a very distinctive unique uh, style of dance which is the ethnic group that is the originator of manipuri dance once again it's not the kukis or anybody else it's the maithes manipur gave the world the game of polo the world's oldest gr- uh, polo ground in the world is in the city of imphal let me f- see if i can locate it uh, let's search for it impal polo ground it's somewhere in the vicinity there, there we are uh, so somewhere here i think it's this one the polo ground yeah this is the world's oldest polo ground the question is which ethnic group gave the world the game of polo once again it is the maithes so you can see a pattern here when it comes to manipuri martial arts when it comes to any aspect of manipuri culture or history or civilization when it comes to the archaeological record of manipur it is all the history of the maithes then it's at least 2000 years old okay so the point is that the maithes are the originators of the manipuri kingdom the manipuri culture the civilization the language everything and the other ethnic group that is the that is also indigenous to manipur is the people that we now call the nagas they are, they are a group of um, a large group of hill tribes very uh, you know tribal people who live in the hills so the history is that initially everybody in manipur lived in the hills initially like as in at least 2000 years ago uh, when the with the valley region was under water everybody lived in the hills then once the valley started drying out some some of the uh, manipuri uh, the the, ori- the people uh, settled in the valley and some chose to stay in the hills but they were the same people and over the past 2000 years there have been cultural changes linguistic changes so that's that's the origin of the naga maithe dichotomy but they are still originally the same people they are the descendants of the same ancestors the nagas and the maithes so the nagas are equally indigenous to this region the kingdom of manipur was way larger in the past uh 
you know uh, today uh, today it is uh, i mean let's let's go back to the screen yeah this is manipur today the state of manipur it was in the past much larger um, there was a king called khagemba in the 16th or 17th century who conquered parts of yunnan in china so the manipur kingdom extended all the way to yunnan parts of yunnan in china in the past the parts of nagaland present in nagaland were part of manipur parts of burma were part of manipur right so if you see the city of uh, for example mandalay in burma so i showed you the the uh, i showed you the kangla fort in imphal let's let's go to that again so this is what remains of the kangla fort it's about 2000 years old it's a roughly a square kind of or rectangular kind of structure it has a moat and it, it is protected by river river the imphal river it has a fort and all that now let's go to the city of mandalay in burma uh, where is mandalay here is mandalay all right let's go to mandalay now let's go to the satellite image there is a fort in mandalay the mandalay palace it's about 2 300 years old or so roughly you can look up how old it is it is essentially a replica a more modern replica of the kangla fort in imphal which tells you how influential manipuri culture was even in burma how influential manipur as a kingdom was even in burma So that's kind of the origin of Manipur. The Manipuri kings had excellent relations with the neighboring kingdoms, Tripura, Assam, uh, even Burma, etc. They they married among these these various kingdoms and all that. Uh, you know that's the kind of uh, origin story that Manipur has. So historically, its king its uh, territorial boundaries extended way beyond. what we have today as the state of manipur the state of manipur in its present form is because of the british uh, occupation of india of manipur and what they delineated as the territorial boundaries of manipur so that's kind of the origin story of manipur the origin the history of the origin of manipur and the reason behind the diversity of manipur there are so many different tribes in manipur hill tribes and then you have the metes who live who now are forcibly confined to the, to 6% of the state the imphal valley so you have lots of different tribes who are now classified as nagas a naga is an umbrella term it's not their own language it is the british who gave this term to the to them and they classified them as nagas there are lots of different tribes among the nagas as well the angami nagas the the mao the tangkhul and so on and so forth lots of different tribes uh, some of them don't even speak the same language but they are classified as nagas but originally if you go back 2 to 2 and a half maybe 3000 3 and a half 1000 years they all descend from the same ancestral uh, population so that is the origin of manipur that's how it was established uh, school of thoughts well uh, the nagas had their own polytheistic culture you know the, 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 you had elements of animism you had elements of nature worship you had an elements of ancestor worship it was a polytheistic culture that was the original beautiful naga culture it's been smashed out of existence the, the nagas are almost entirely exclusively christian now uh, some naga tribal groups uh, such as the uh, well if you would call the kabui as a naga group then they are still hindus but yeah the original culture was smashed out of them by the british and then today they have they they feel no uh, affinity to their original culture they are taught to believe that it was primitive and backward and barbaric and and think like that you know standard practice standard colonial practice of of imposing a foreign religion and then making people ashamed feel ashamed of their ancestral culture so uh, that is about the uh, ancestral original culture of the nagas when it comes to the metes uh, their uh, natural original uh, if you would call it religion it is called sanamahism in english so it is a once again a very uh, complex polytheistic culture and about well as you can see manipur is kind of at the crossroads between uh, the indian subcontinent and southeast asia indian subcontinent was obviously hindu and buddhist and southeast asia was also hindu and buddhist so obviously manipur would have influences of all these things uh so the oldest known record of hinduism in manipur dates back to the i think 7th or 8th century ad uh, there is this copper plate inscription or something of a manipuri king with sanskrit words and, and names of uh, various gods and goddesses that sort of thing hindu gods and goddesses the oldest hanuman i think uh, Hanuman temple in Manipur go dates back to the 12th or 13th century in the 18th century there was this big flowering of Vaishnavism in Manipur so today most Manipuris they either metes i would say 
they practice a mix of the ancestral culture sanamaism and hinduism elements of both kind of like japan where everybody whoever is still religious practices elements of shinto as well as buddhism hinduism that sort of thing so that's uh, and and now uh, see the the british tried to christianize the the state of manipur the nagaland etc the nagas the mizos down south they were christianized rapidly the metes resisted for decades after independence 1947 manipur merged with india in 1949 after independence uh, the the indian government the nehruvian regime uh, brought in lots of american missionaries to christianize the the, the far east of india the metes still resisted but today in the past 20 or so years the metes have started giving up and today there are about 2 or 3 lakh mete christians so the metes are also giving up and they are also becoming christianized but uh, so, so that's the thing so that's the story of manipur the history of manipur the origin of the kingdom uh the diversity the schools of thought the religion all of that i hope that uh, show, throws some light on on the history and the culture of the place now next question is by gotham why did the british force the manipuri king uh, excuse me to settle burmese nationals into manipur why did the british force the manipuri king to settle burmese nationals into manipur okay so the british so we have to understand when does britain come into the picture uh, we know that the british uh, the last 300 or so years about 300 or so years ago they had uh, they had started colonizing india uh, their first foothold was in bengal present day west bengal and bangladesh unified bengal and then what happened is in the 18th century you had this great flowering of vaishnava culture in manipur a great uh, era of of uh, cultural efflorescence and all that then in the beginning of the 19th century things went bad the royal succession was messed up um, there was infighting for succession for becoming the next king uh, there was political disunity there was political instability and i think it was the year 1819 that the burmese invaded and conquered manipur burma as you can see is south of manipur very large uh, kingdom today it's a country myanmar burma so the burmese <laughs> king invaded manipur successfully in 1819 and occupied manipur for 7 years so from 1819 to 1826 approximately if i am if i recall correctly the burmese occupied manipur it was a disastrous time for manipur they took incredible amounts numbers of manipuri uh, prisoners of war and they settled them in they took them to burma to use them as as slave labor their descendants still live there today um, you know burmese metes who still practice their culture uh, lots of manipuris metes were forced to escape to parts of assam to tripura and so on just to survive uh, those are the uh, and you know even even bengal uh, you could say places like silhet etc so this is the origin of the bishnupriya metes who live outside of present day manipur and manipur was devastated so it's called seven years of devastation chahi tarat kuntakpa from 1819 to 1826 eventually the manipuri king was able to take control of manipur again but he had to turn to the british for protection because the burmese threat was always there and that is the entry of the british into manipuri into manipur and essentially manipur then became a british protectorate of british puppet of british vassal state that's what happened the british would uh, they installed a political agent in the court of the manipuri king and that's where everything started going bad so uh, the british they were also uh, expanding into burma and all that so there is a place called chin state let's go and see chin state chin state uh well what not china state chin state okay so this shaded region is chin state and that's where you have the zo people you know the chin zo people zo chin whatever you want to call them it's a tribal group it's a bunch of tribes one of the tribes is called thadau there are other tribes as well it's an agglomeration or whatever you want to call it of of uh, reasonably closely related tribes and they are not burmese by the way 
they don't speak the Burmese language. But the Burmese language is is not something they speak. They don't practice Burmese culture. The Burmese are they have historically been Hindu and Buddhist. Today it's called a Buddhist nation. Well, the the uh, Chin people are not Buddhist. They don't speak the B- Burmese language. They don't practice Burmese culture, and they are essentially fighting a war uh, for secession from Burma, separatism. So, the British uh, ventured into this region, and they started settling. Uh, these Burmese nationals in small numbers in Manipur. Uh, they said that these guys are going to help us as porters and all that. They're going to be, you know, they're going to do some uh, labor work for us and things like that. And uh, the term they used for these people was coolies. But then it morphed into cookies. Right? So the original, uh, the origin of the word cookie is, is coolie. So then the British started settling them in Manipur. Why did they want to settle these outsiders, these foreigners into Manipur? It was to the classic tactic of divide and rule. So you see, the British uh, started exercising a significant amount of influence and control over the Manipuri kingdom, over the policies of the Manipuri king. And everybody could see what's happening. The British were taking over. And the hill people who are now called the Nagas, they always had this close allegiance and alliance with the with the Maitis, with the, with the Manipuri king. Overall, they have been the same people historically. So the, the so-called Nagas, who are now called Nagas, they would conduct raids on British positions and, you know, they would harass the British, you know, and things like that. And this was in support of the Manipuri king. So the British wanted to create, to drive a wedge in this uh, entire uh, arrangement. So they brought in these outsiders, these uh, these tribes people who were not Burmese but who were in Burmese territory. They started settling them in Manipur. They started by settling them in the south, the southern regions of Manipur. You know, south of Imphal and all that. These were all... Naga territories. There were lots of hill people who are now called Nagas who lived in all these regions. South of Imphal, More, Churachan, south of Churachanpur, etc. These uh, tribals, these Burmese nationals, tribals, they were settled here and slowly over a few decades, they brutally and violently ethnically cleansed the, the Nagas from these parts of Manipur. So the point of doing this was to create instability and trouble and not allow the Nagas to be at peace so that they can fight the British and also to create problems for the Metis and the Manipuri king. It's That's a classic troublemaking approach the British have always employed across the world. So that's why the British made the Manipuri king settle Burmese nationals in Manipur. Uh, how many were settled? When did this happen? Let's take a look at that. Uh, let us go here. So this, uh, one second, not this one. Let me check. Okay, here we are. So this, I think it began sometime in the late 19th century. It speaks about, this is a a snippet of a book. It says in January and February 1872, uh, there were expeditions and all that, the captives, uh, uh, all that stuff. The whole of the above have been settled by the Maharaja in the Thangjing range of hills and valley southwest of Moirang. So these are all, you know, some of what we call cookies now. See, Kongjai cookies and all that. Uh, so yeah, they say that the Maharaja did this, but it was done at the behest of the British. So that's how it happened. It is the classic divide and rule strategy. It, it create trouble for the natives by settling outsiders who are inimical to you, who don't respect and value your culture, who want to grab land, that's what the British did, to create trouble in Manipur, so that they could rule by creating trouble, dividing everybody, making everybody fight each other, so that they could exploit that situation. That's why the British did that. I bet he doesn't even know how the term cookie originated. Like I said, the term cookie originates from the word coolie. The British brought in these uh, tribal tribes people from Chin state in Burma, settled them in Manipur. Uh, their their job was to be porters and laborers, and they were called cool, coolies. Eventually, that morphed into the term cookies. 
So these foreign outsiders who were settled by the British in the 19th century in Manipur were originally called Kulis by them, but then the term morphed into the word that we use now, Kuki. Next, uh, two questions, two two comments. 22,400 square kilometers of Manipur never had form foreign Burmese tribes before the advent of the British. And someone responds, your total land area was 700 square kilometers, will always be 700 square kilometers, brother. So the first, so the first, uh, uh, this one here, this, the first line is by clearly somebody who's a Meite. And the second one is by somebody who is a cookie and who, who claims that Meites always were residing in the Imphal Valley region, 700 square kilometers. Once again, let's go and see the map. Once again, let's go and see the map. Uh, the Imphal Valley region is roughly 700 square kilometers. And the Kukis claim the, the Maitis always lived there and everything else is either Naga or Kuki territory, mainly Kuki territory. That is the claim the Kukis have been making of late. And that's what this comment is about. right? So let's see how, how true this is. Let's see the veracity. Let's examine the veracity of, of this claim. So this is a book that was written in 1873 by somebody called R. Brown, clearly a British occupier. It says native state of Manipur, the hill territory under its rule. So it clearly says that the hill territory is under the rule of the state of Manipur or the kingdom of Manipur. And we know who are the rulers, they are the Metis. So once again, that, that makes it very clear. Now, uh, let's get into this. So, so this is written in uh, in 18, 18 what? Let's see once again, 1873. So this is well after the British started settling outsiders into Manipur. And the British by that time have, have started re-engineering the boundaries and the map of Manipur. So let's see what it says here. The territory which constitutes the native state of Manipur consists of a large extent of hill territory and the proper value of Manipur. Uh, it gives you the latitudes and longitudes 24, 30, 25, 60, and longitude 93, 10, 94, 60. Uh, okay, so uh, the northern boundaries of Manipur are the Angami country, which is uh, currently Nagaland, and the hills of the valleys of Assam. The south, the boundary is undefined, and so on. Abuts on a country inhabited by various tribes of Lushai Kukis, which is the Chin, Chin territory of, of present day Burma. So if you look at the, the latitude and longitudes that this person has given, and if you superpose that on a map, you will see, you will see this. The, the darker colored region in the map, on the map, is what this person has stated. Obviously, it will not be exactly square or, or rectangular, but you get the point. So that actually includes the present-day Nagaland capital of Kohima and the city of Dimapur as well. And this is another different way of representing that. So this is what the guy claims was the roughly the boundaries of Manipur uh, in 1873. <coughs> Excuse me. So clearly, and, and you know, there was something called uh, there was something called Kabo Valley. So the Kabo Valley was part of the Manipur kingdom. It's now part of Burma because our great magnificent Prime Minister Sri Jawaharlal Nehruji gave it away as if it was in her own personal property to give to Burma. right? So the Kabo Valley was part of the Manipur kingdom and it was uh, given away, I mean, it was given on lease by the British to Burma. Okay, let's see. So this is the kingdom of Burma. You can see the Kabo Valley was part of Manipur. Uh, this over here is the Kabo Valley. Uh, now let's see. So this is the Kabo Valley on the map. And this is the agreement. It is the intention of the Supreme Government to grant a monthly stipend of 500 Sikka rupees to the Raja of Manipur to commence on the 9th day of January 1834, the date at which the transfer of Kabo took place as shown in the agreement and so on. So the Burmese would give the Manipuri king, Maharaja, Raja, a, a payment, a monthly stipend, a monthly payment in exchange for the valley, which would be on lease to Burma. It doesn't become part of Burmese territory, right? And this is uh, for the details of that. You can check it out. You can freeze the screen, pause the screen, and and take a look at this, right? I'm going to take it off the screen now. If you want to see the Burm the Kabo Valley, I can show it to you on the map itself. Uh, so once again, we go back to the map and we search for Kabo Valley. 
which is near More. Yes, so this is the Kabo Valley. As you can see, it's near More in Tamu. And uh, it's slightly smaller than the Imphal Valley, but it's a significant region. So all of this was part of the kingdom of Manipur. You had Maites living in all these places. You know, you cannot keep on uh, distorting history to base to, to suit your agendas and all that. Uh, so it, it's quite clear, it's evidently clear from the British records themselves the, how large the kingdom of Manipur was, how large the territories under its domain were. It's very clear that the, Ch the Chin people, the so-called cookies, came from Chin state. They were not Manipuris. They were never in Manipur. It's the British who settled them there. I think it's very clear if you examine just a few historical records, which are all available in the public domain. So I would encourage everybody to look into this. So these claims that your total area was 700 square kilometers are laughable, they are risible, they are asinine, and they are complete propaganda and fiction. The cookies are not Manipuris. They are not, they have never been Indians. They were settled by the British as troublemakers in the late 19th century. So so that's, that's the deal. Okay. <laughs> Wawun Chawi says the cookies are original settlers of Manipur just as Maitais and Naga so that's that's complete fiction like I have just demonstrated uh, that obviously is is what these people claim now let's let's if if these people claim that they are the original settlers of Manipur so she, she this lady is using the word settlers settlers the Maitais have been around for three and a half thousand years they're not settlers. And so the same goes for the Nagas. The cookies are settlers who were settled artificially as a, as a demographic reengineering project by the British in Manipur in the late 19th century. And even in the 20th century, the cookies were always regarded by the government of India as refugees. Even though the government of India was, was, was settling them in Manipur for, for some reason. You know what? The government of India after 1947 was absolutely clueless about the Far East of India. They had no understanding of the history, the culture, the demographics, anything. Absolutely clueless. They did everything, remote control, everything from Delhi, the Nehruvian government. And they simply continued the British policies in Manipur and in the Northeast. So they kept on settling these outsiders, these foreigners in India. Let me show you the evidence. You will say, where's the evidence? Where is the proof? Well, uh, please, please don't mind me showing you some evidence of that. This is June 6 or 8, whatever it is, 1968. It is uh, Under Secretary Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation, blah, blah, blah. Deputy Commissioner Manipur, that's where the letter comes from. Please refer to my letter number, whatever, dated the 6th of April, 1968, copy enclosed for ready reference and expedite your report regarding resettlement of cookie refugees from Burma. So in 1968, also the government of India was very clear that these cookies were refugees from Burma. And I don't know why we were settling them in, in Manipur and in India. Why? Why? Is India a goddamn dharamshala that anybody can come can be settled? Don't we have any standards? Isn't India supposed to be a sacred land for, land for Indians only? So this is what the government did in 1968. They had been doing this since 1949, since Manipur became a part of India. First the Nehruvian regime and then subsequent regimes. After independence, the Nehruvian regime started issuing missionary visas. Missionary visas. Come, convert our people to your wonderful foreign religion. And it was mainly American missionaries who started flocking to the far east of India, into Manipur, into Nagaland, into Mizoram. And they succeeded wildly in Nagaland and Mizoram. Mizoram was more than 90% Christian by around 1950. That's how rapid the demographic reengineering was. And Nagaland took about until the 1980s to become 90% Christian. So you can see that the government of India refers to these cookies as refugees from Burma. So they are not Indians. They are cookie refugees from Burma. Want to see more? Here we go. Once again, this is from 1968. Once again, it says, Alad, it says, this office is not in a position to give comments regarding the legality of the entry of a large number of cookie tribal refugees from Burma. Whether these refugees are to be accepted in this country is a decision of policy for the government to consider. 
Some refugees have settled in the vicinity of Konkan Thana village in Ukrul, and this land is being claimed by the neighboring villages. So you could see the roots of the problem. The neighboring villages were saying this is our land, but the government of India was settling these foreign cookie alien refugees in India. You see, it was this was happening in 1968 itself. This problem, the roots go go back to to the British occupation of Manipur, late second half of a 19th century, and even more in the 20th century, the roots are the policies of the Indian government in the after independence. Ridiculous policies, settling cookie aliens in Indian soil, Indian territory. And you can see at that time itself, the various local villages were saying, this is our land. How can you give it to these people? So, you know, it's a this disaster. You can see the disaster in the making over here from these letters. The disaster in the making right here. 1968, you can see the roots of the disaster, which we are, which we are currently witnessing in Manipur right now. Foreigners being settled in India, claiming Indian territory as their own. And that just continued on and on and on. Here's something more recent. There was a coup in Burma in 2021. The Burmese junta, the Burmese, the, the, the Burmese military took back power from Aung San Suu Kyi's government. And uh, there's a civil war going on in Burma, and it's displayed displaced 1,827,000 people since February 21, out of which 53,000 officially from Chin state have entered India's northeast states of Mizoram and Manipur. Who allowed these foreigners to enter India? For what purpose? How did the government of India make the choice, the decision of allowing these refugees into India? Is that our problem? Is that India's problem? I just don't understand these goddamn policies, which we are still seeing today. We are still seeing these policies today. Let's see further. And see, it says 53,000 uh, individuals Cookies have entered as refugees uh, in the last since February 21. That's an official figure. The actual figure, as we all know, is going to be a multiple of that, like five times, ten times of that. Okay. This is a press release from 24th July 2023. So on 23rd of July 23, 705 cookies crossed into. The, across the India India Myanmar border and entered Manipur Chandel district and all the specific details of how many males how many females how many children which area how many everything is given in great detail which means that they did not enter quietly or or, or surreptitiously they the they their entry was 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 monitored and the number of men children etc women children were was all noted down and recorded which means the security forces who are guarding the borders allowed this to happen and recorded every single individual. And the government of Manipur has, said, <coughs> has given a show cause notice. Why did you allow this to happen? And send them back. But I'm sure they've not been sent back. Here we have some more. Illegal. It says very clearly illegal immigrants. All these cookies are illegal immigrants. Please understand this. They are not Indians. So... This this claim that these individuals make that cookies are original settlers of Manipur, and that's what the Indian media is 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 you know amplifying. The Indian media, which is, I I just don't understand the Indian media is amplifying all this nonsense. So so that's the deal. These cookies are foreign refugees, illegal infiltrators. I think I have demonstrated it very clearly through all these documents. The cookies aren't Indians. They have never been Indians. They have no affinity with Indian culture. They have nothing in common with the people of India, the people of the Far East of India, the, the Metis and the Nagas. Nothing in common with them. But they want their territory. That's what's happening. The cookies, <laughs> they're foreigners. Aliens. Illegal aliens. Please understand this. Okay, next question. Vinup Malkani says, okay, thank you. Uh, what are the best measures to curb the foreign interference to curtail the local insurgencies in India? I mean, I'm sure you mean the Far East of India. To understand what we can do to curtail all this nonsense, we have to understand the origins of these insurgencies. Okay. So after 1947, 1949, 1949, Manipur joins the Union of India. After that, the government of India, like I said, adopted 
the same policies that the, that the British adopted. They said that if our British masters were doing something, it should have been, it must have been the right thing. So let's continue the same policies. So they completely isolated the Far East of India from the rest of India. Let's go go back to the map so that you understand what's happening. Uh, so the Nehruvian regime. It starts with the, Mr. Nehru, the great man himself. Yeah, what he did was he completely isolated and cut off the Far East of India, Assam onwards, completely isolated this region from the rest of India. There was there were no there was no new infrastructure that was constructed. Very few roads were constructed. No new railways. Even today, we hardly have any railways in the Far East of India. No airports. No connections. No hospitals, no schools, nothing, no jobs, no progress, no development. And then you had this inner line permit system, which means that if even if you lived in India and you wanted to visit this part of India, you would need law, a special permission for which you would have to answer all kinds of questions and they could deny it to you. So that marginalized the Far East of India, completely isolated it, completely, uh, you know, first of all, the the... The original kingdoms had been destroyed. The princely states had their power was taken away, uh, and then this new governance system, the Nehruvian governance system, was imposed, which was a disaster. So the people over here they felt neglected. They felt that they were being given a very cruel stepmotherly treatment. There was no development. Nobody could get jobs. Nobody could earn money. The only choice you had was either you you become a drug addict because the golden triangle is right next door the drug producing region or you you become a terrorist or an insurgent and you fight for independence so this caused a sudden explosion spontaneous explosion of insurgencies separatist insurgencies in all the states of the far east of india whether it is assam whether it is nagaland whether it's manipur whether it's mizoram everywhere every state erupted in insurgencies and every state there were multiple insurgent groups so in mizoram you had the mizos you know and that insurgency went so became so bad that a uh, former prime minister mrs gandhi indira gandhi she had to take the incredible step, step of asking the indian air force to bomb the capital city of aizawl and other, other places that's how bad the mizo insurgency had become Right, in in Assam you had the Bodo, the Bodo thing and all. Nagaland you had various insurgent groups. In Manipur you had Naga insurgents, Maite insurgents, and so on. Imagine, imagine this. Try to comprehend this. Try to comprehend this. The Maites in the nineteen in the twentieth century were all Hindus. Today, lots of them have converted to Christianity. Sadly. In the 20th century, the Maites were all Hindus and they were fighting. They, they had insurgent groups who were fighting to separate Manipur from India. Imagine Hindus being treated so badly they want to separate from India. Can you imagine that? Can you comprehend that? It tells you the status of Hindus in India. It gives you a very good idea of how Hindus are treated in India. Hindus don't, did not want to be a part of India. That was the situation. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. So that's why you had all these insurgencies in the Far East of India because of the absolutely horrible, cruel marginalization and stepmotherly treatment given by the government of India to this entire enormous region. Right? So that's why you had insurgencies. And then you obviously had the Christianization. Mr. Nehru you know, gave a red carpet welcome to hordes of American Christian missionaries to convert all the people. You know, entire populations, entire tribes, entire states, Nagaland and Mizoram, especially Meghalaya also, you have so, so much of that. Now they are trying to convert Ar Arunachal Pradesh as well. So, you know, I have absolutely nothing against somebody choosing a new spiritual path, a new religious path. Let's say you are tired of your religion. You feel that it's not helping you spiritually and you want to try something different. It's your choice. Go ahead. Try any religion you want. Try Christianity. Try try Baha'ism, whatever it is. Try the old Egyptian religion. Try anything you want. It's your choice. You have the right to do that. I have nothing against that. I have nothing against any religion. But I have a strong issue with the neo-colonial practice of artificially re-engineering the religious demographics of, of regions on a mass industrial scale. This is nothing but neo-colonization. And this has political motives. 
So that is the problem. And that's what Mr. Nehru facilitated in the Northeast. So today what you find is that, that there are large populations who have completely lost touch with their ancestral culture, their roots, and they no longer see themselves as some so as people who have any affinity with India. And that is a huge issue. So you're finding this issue everywhere in very large parts of the Far East of India. So these are the issues. So to curtail the local insurgences in these regions, you have to address the root causes, right? Uh, yeah, so that's the thing. Okay, Little Prince 7144 says, irony of Maites are in favor of cookies during... Okay, he or she is claiming that Maites were in favor of cookies during the cookie Naga clashes of 1993 and supported the policy of divided rule by parting mostly Naga inhabited districts in the hills. Today's Maites are facing the consequences of their blunder decision and short-sightedness. Till today, many Nagas are refugees in their own land occupied by cookies. No government is interested or initiated to resettle, to resettle those Naga villages. You know, this is the perception the media has created that the Maites were pro-cookie. Here's what happened. In the 1990s, there were these terrible Naga cookie clashes. The cookies were encroaching in more and more into Naga territory, the hill territory, and they were taking over their lands. So eventually the Naga said enough is enough and they went, they pushed back. Violently, very violently. There was this ramp, these, these horrible clashes, riots. And the Nagas went after the cookies with a vengeance, okay? I, I don't even want to go into how what they did. The Nagas went after the cookies. So the cookie oppressors, the cookie aggressors were suddenly on the back foot. And they were being, you know, hunted down by the Nagas in certain regions, in certain parts of Manipur. And the media has created the impression that the Maites were in favor of the cookies. The Maites were not in favor of the cookies or anybody. They, they tried to intervene and calm the situation down. And whoever was being affected, they kind of, you know, gave them shelter for some time and that sort of thing. The Maites did not take the side of the cookies. And against the Nagas. It was not that sort of thing, but I'm sure that's the, the narrative that has been created now. And I'm sure lots of people believe that. The myth is just tried to play peacemaker, stop fighting, that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, today the, the impression has been created that the myth is, uh, took the side of the cookies, the, which they did not. Uh, yeah, it is true. The Nagas today are refugees in their own land. The same as Maitis. What's happened to the Maitis? It first happened to the Nagas. Right? The entirety of southern Manipur, okay, the southern part of Manipur, all of it, south of Churachandpur, south of More, this entire region was the abode of the hill people who are now called the Nagas. There was not a single Burmese individual there. But now, you have Burmese everywhere. These cookies. These were all Naga territories. The Nagas were ethnically cleansed brutally and violently from these regions. And certain tribal groups like the Paite and the Khmar and the Combs were allowed to continue existing on the condition that they start identifying as cookies. So you will find that the Paites and the Khmars and uh, various uh, the Anals, the, these tribes, uh, tribal groups, they are now classified as cookies. They were never cookies. They are not cookies. But today they are classified as that. So the, the trade-off was that we will allow you to survive. We will not kill you all. But you have to identify yourself as cookies. That's what the cookies did. <clears throat> so yes, there are so many Nagas who have lost their lands, their refugees in their own land. The same that's happening to the Maites. The government, yeah, well, what can I say? All the Naga, in, Naga villages are gone. In the past couple of decades, God knows how many lakhs of cookies have entered, entered Manipur. Many of them enter through Mizoram and they are given access, you know, they, they are transported across Mizoram and then settled in Manipur. That's what's happening. And the entire border is open. It's a very hilly forested region. It's very difficult to, to, to you know, uh, to fence it. But I think that's something that needs to happen. So, uh, yeah, to answer this question or this comment, the Maitis were not in favor of the cookies. They were simply trying to calm things down to play peacemakers, not favoring one side or another. Uh, but yes, they, they were kind of, you could say, kind, you know, to the cookies. And now they're being paying, paid back by the cookies for being kind to them. By, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so understand the Maitis did not take 
the, the side opposite of the Nagas. They did not stop the Nagas or prevent or fight the Nagas or impede the Nagas in whatever they were doing. They simply tried to calm things down and maybe help out whoever was affected. And today this, this impression has been created. Okay, Sana Jauba Angom says, how can we deal with the aliens who have infiltrated from Myanmar and who are getting into politics and the academia, academic circles of India? And Akhil says, all are making the Metis villains who are Hindus who don't have any reservations. Right, you know, so what happens? Lacks of these cookies, they infiltrate into, into India, into Mani, Manipur, uh, either from the Chin State directly or via Mizoram. That's what the Manipuri media has been reporting for a long time. They are foreigners. They come into Manipur, they settle down, they create new villages. You know, in the past few years, more than a thousand new villages have appeared in Manipur. Uh, Let's go back to the map. You will not see these villages on the map of Manipur. But if you see, if you go to Google Earth and you see the satellite images, you will see at least a thousand villages that have cropped up in recent times that are not registered and that they do not appear on the map. So that's an, there's an incredibly huge influx of illegal foreign Burmese nationals into Manipur. It's always Manipur. It's not Mizoram. The Mizos are not settling any cookie in Mizoram. They are being told to go and settle in Manipur. You see, it's interesting. Uh, so we, when once these people settle down in, say, Manipur, they automatically are... They, they, you know what happens? First of all, they acquire... Indian documentation. Let me show you evidence of that. They acquire Indian documentation. So let me give you. Ah, here we are. Okay. So these guys, once they reach India, they acquire other cards. Uh, other cards are being essentially sold for eight thousand rupees a piece in Mizoram. Myanmar refugees in Mizoram found with forged government documents. The same thing is happening with illegal Bangladeshi. The same thing is happening with illegal Rohingyas. They all get get genuine Aadhaar cards. Once you have an Aadhaar card, you can get a passport. And that's it. That's it. You're a citizen. So that's how easy it is. 8,000 bucks and you get an Aadhaar card. And I assure you, it's not going to be a fake Aadhaar card. So that's what happens. So once they get an Aadhaar card and then, then they are Indian nationals, even though the Aadhaar card is not official proof of nationality, but the passport is. And you can get a passport on the basis of an Aadhaar card. So what nonsense is this? That the other, the other, other documentation is not enough for nationality. You can get a passport on the basis of that. That is proof of nationality. So that's how easy it is for these Burmese illegal infiltrators to get Indian documentations. Once this happens, they are classified as scheduled tribes. So they get all kinds of benefits and perks that the Metis don't get. They get reservations in schools and colleges and universities. They get uh, financial benefits. They get reservations in government jobs, in you know academic jobs. They, get, they become professors. They become academics. They become IAS officers. They become IPS officers. When the entire Manipur... Uh, this entire issue started in, in the beginning of May. The DGP of Manipur was a cookie. You see? <clears throat> so that's what's happening. These guys automatically, the moment they settle down in India, and in a week or two or whatever time it takes to get other card and then maybe a passport or whatever else, then they immediately get all kinds of benefits that, that ordinary Indian citizens don't get. The Maitis are general category. Like all other Hindus, like most other Hindus. I, I don't know. I Let me take that back. The myth is a general category. They are not SC or ST or whatever. So they get no benefits, no reservations in their own land, in their own state. They are marginalized. They are confined to 6% of the territory by Indian law. Yeah. And then these outsiders, the foreigners who come in, who, they, who came in two weeks ago, get all kinds of benefits. That's what happens. And there are professors in certain universities in India who were born in Burma. It's it's documented. There are certain people who have served as MPs in Bur- Burma's parliament who are now Indian nationals. That's the kind of joke that India has become today. No standards at all. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so they get into politics, they become politicians, they become professors, they become police officers, they become IAS officers, they become lawyers, they become advocates. And because it's so, they get so many benefits from, you know, 
So it's easy for them to do all this. And they start occupying all the positions of power just a few years after they enter India illegally. This is what India is doing to its own people. And it's a, it's a disaster. So how can we deal with this? The government has to crack down on this nonsense. What needs to happen is an NRC to identify all the foreigners. That, the, that NRC has to be done properly, not on the basis of other cards, which are all fake. Anybody can get an other card for 8,000 bucks. So you can't make that the basis of your national register of citizens. Do you have another card or not? That's not enough. You have to prove your the you have to prove that your ancestors were in India before a certain cutoff date. That's what you have to prove. If you can't prove it, and you can't force the Maitis to do this, you have to apply this only to the outsiders. So yeah, that could be a way of dealing with this, but will the government do it? To what extent will will, will they do it? I don't know. Holy Chrome says, uh, could you please shed some light on the SOO and explain why the government of India is not taking decisive action to crush the foreign invaders despite having extensive evidence? So what is this SOO? That's what we want to see, right? The Suspension of Operations Agreement. Uh, do I have something to deal with that? Okay. So the Suspension of Operations Agreement is something that... that came into effect in, th- in 2008. The then government of India entered into this agreement with the cookie insurgents, the cookie terrorists. That government of India was led by the great Sri uh, Manmohan Singh Ji, as we know. So that government uh, entered into this uh, agreement with the cookie terrorists. In this, As part of this agreement, the cookie terrorists were a- allowed to keep their weapons, all their weapons, they were made to register the number of terrorists that they have. They were allowed to keep operating their terrorist camps with weapons, with their flags, with their fake, fictitious nation's flag. Um, and they were the, the local uh, paramilitary forces like the Assam Rifles were told to monitor the, the, the activities on a routine basis. So that established good relations within the Assam Rifles and the cookie terrorists. That's what is being said, allegedly. Uh, so that was the suspension of operations agreement. When it came to the Meithe insurgent groups, they were all disarmed. They were all required to put down their weapons and they were totally disarmed. Some of these so-called insurgent groups, they still operate maybe across the border in Burma or somewhere, but they don't have any public support at all. The Meithe people, the Manipuri people want peace, they want development. That's what they've always wanted. So the Meites were disarmed. The cookies were allowed to keep their weapons, their sophisticated weapons from where they got all that. Yeah. And they were allowed to keep their terrorist camps. Let's take a look at the location of these terrorist camps, shall we? Take a look. These bur- these cookie terrorist camps, they ring fence the Imphal Valley, the city of Imphal. You, you must have heard of the Chinese string of pearls strategy to encircle India. Well, see, the Meites, the original people of Manipur, are forced by Indian law to only live in the Imphal Valley. They are not allowed access to the rest of their ancestral territories. And this small, tiny territory where they are, they are forced to be confined to, that is now ring-fenced by these cookie terrorist camps. This is the suspension of operations agreement of India. (coughs) Excuse me. And it is it is alleged that the cookies terrorists they they are not, uh, you know, upholding the terms of the suspension of operations agreement. And uh, more terrorists are coming in from the Chin state, from across Burma, Mm -hmm. and so on. So that essentially is the suspension of operations agreement. The government of India, the Manmohan Singh government, gave special preferential uh, treatment and status to the cookie terrorists, the cookie insurgents. They disarmed the Metis. Why, why give preference and special treatment to foreign aliens, illegal infiltrators? I just don't get it. They, why, why were they not disarmed like everybody else? Why were they allowed to continue on? And why were they allowed to ring fence the capital city like that? I just don't understand. So that's what the SOO is, the Suspension of Operations Agreement. It's, and, and another clause in the SOO was that each cookie terrorist who is registered will be given a stipend of 6,000 rupees per month at Indian taxpayer expense. So every year when you pay taxes, some of it goes 
into the pockets of the Koki terrorists. It's a great privilege for all of, all of us to be funding the Koki terrorists. So the question is, why, does the, why is the government of India not taking decisive action to crush the foreign invaders, despite having extensive evidence? We have all the evidence of these people in their uh, terrorist activities and what they're doing. Now, as I have demonstrated, this problem started more than a century ago. The roots of the problem are in the second half of the 19th century, the whole of the 20th century, post-independence, we made it even worse, our government, right? So that's where the pro- that's how the problem has been made to exist. That's how the problem was created. Now, unfortunately, it is Mr. Man- Mr. Narendra Modi's job to fix everything. He has inherited these enormous issues and he is required to solve all the problems. And if he can't solve them in uh, a few months or a few years, then he, he's the bad guy. Right? That's see, people don't have patience, and that's why people are upset. Uh, the question is, why is India not taking decisive action? The government knows what the cookies are doing. The thing is, there is almost no distinction today between the cookie terrorists and regular infiltrators who are living in the villages. The terrorists also have families in the villages. I am sure there are weapons in the villages, automatic weapons and all that in the villages. So. If you want to actually disarm the cookies, you will have to go not only only the, to, the, to the terrorist camps, but also into the villages. And that's going to be, essentially, you'll have to take action against civilians. And they're going to fight back. And then you're going to have to shoot at civilians, which you can't. I mean, you can, but then, because they're terrorists, but then the whole world is waiting for this to happen. The whole world is waiting for something like this to happen so that they can blame India for human rights violation and fascism and oppression of minorities and blah, blah, blah. So that is the dilemma India is currently in. It will take time to solve this problem, unfortunately. Until then, the wonderful people of Manipur have to suffer. So that is the deal. That's what's happening. Okay, next. Sanajauba Angom says, How can we deal with illegal influxes from Burma? First thing is to, uh, you know, fence the border, which is a very difficult and lengthy time-consuming task. We will have to fence the border not only of Manipur and Burma, but also Mizoram and Burma. And will the Mizo people be open to fencing the border? And will the cookies allow fencing the border? Because they control all the border areas. But it has to be done if we want to stop the illegal influx. You know, ideally, we, we don't want to have a fenced border with Burma. The Burmese people are a very nice people. They have the same culture as us. In 1935, the people of Burma voted to not separate from India, but the British still separated Burma from India. It's only the cookies <laughs> who are a problem. They are fighting a war against the Burmese nation too, a secessionist, separatist war. So the only solution right now is to fence the border with Burma, which is going to be an in, enormous endeavor. It's going to take years. That's the or the, the other thing is you cooperate with the Burmese government to uh, let's say subdue the terrorist activities of the cookies in Chin State, because the entire problem is coming from Chin State in Burma. Chin State, which I just showed you. Let's go again. Chin State, Chin State, Myanmar. <laughs> So this shaded region is the homeland of the cookies. Uh, you know, 500 years ago, they were not even here. The cookies originally came from somewhere in Yunnan, China. And they settled in this region. And they have been fighting the Burmese ever since. So, yeah. So either we fence the entire border, which I would say is a kind of undesirable. We would like to have actually an open border with Burma. Burma is not a hostile country. It's a friendly country. Um so if you want to keep an open border, you have to uh, subdue the separatist terrorist insurgency in Chen State. Maybe we can join hands with the Burmese government to do that or not. Otherwise, we fence the border, which will take years. But yeah, these are the two solutions to stop the illegal influx from Burma. Next question. Margaret says this is a Hindu-Christian conflict. A peaceful Naga says, why the Nagas and 30 other different fellow tribals and Christian communities in Manipur are not supporting the cookies? And there's some some YouTube link. Listen, Margaret, this is not a Hindu-Christian conflict. That is a lie. That is a misrepresentation. 
this naga person himself or herself is saying the nagas and other christian communities are not supporting cookies let's take a look at the history of the cookies in india between 1917 and 1919 the the cookies fought the kabui tribal group and the tangkhul tribal group i think both are now classified as nagas the kabui may not be classified as nagas perhaps the tangkhuls are definitely nagas so the cookies fought the tangkhuls at that time the tangkhuls were still polytheists okay they were not christianized yet in 1917 1990 between 1959 and 1960 the cookies fought a civil war with the khmar tribal group let's take a look at the khmar tribal group shall we who are the khmar people h m a r i'm going to put a wikipedia page on the screen statutory warning you cannot trust wikipedia for everything but i'm just putting it for ease of information so the khmar if you look at this the khmar people is a kuki ethnic group living in northeastern state of manipur and mizoram that's what it says let's go to the history shall we the history of this wikipedia page let's see 500 revisions okay it said that the khmars are a kuki ethnic group now let's see a revision from let's say uh let's say december 2022 in december it said the khmar are one of the ethnic peoples of the kuki chin mizo group Now, if you go back further, let's say to let's say December twenty twenty two. Okay, same thing. Now you go back further. Let's go to let's say September twenty twenty two. It says the Khmer are an ethnic Mizo group. So in September twenty two they were Mizos. In December they were Kuki Chin Mizo, and today they are simply Kukis. You see how these people are manipulating the information on Wikipedia. to suit their agendas and objectives okay the khmar have never been cookies they were one of the hill tribes of manipur and the cookies fought a civil war with them in 1959 1960 they almost eliminated uh, eliminated them and then forced them to start considering themselves cookies to start identify them, themselves as cookies the same thing happened with the anal that's another group then you had the naga cookie clashes in the early in the early to mid 90s 92 to 95 1992 to 1995 roughly at that time the nagas were all christians they had been converted to christianity and the cookies were also christians so how come there was the civil war between the nagas and the cookies in the in the 1990s both were christian groups so where is this the a hindu christian conflict what we are seeing today is a continuation of all these things it's not a new conflict that has started today right and then in the you had various other conflicts the cookies fought the nagas the cookies the, the cook, when i talk about the cookies i'm talking about the thado which is the major tribal group of the cookies they fought the nagas they fought the khmars they fought the paites who are also christians now they fought the dimasas who in 2003 i believe who are assamis in 2003 2004 they fought the karbis in assam and now they are fighting the maites and they are also fighting a civil war in insurgency terrorist insurgency in bangladesh they are also fighting a terrorist insurgency in myanmar they are fighting everybody it's not a religious conflict do not portray this as a hindu christian conflict or any such thing there is nothing religious about this it's an expansionist rapacious group of people tribes people who came from yunnan originally who are now trying to create an imaginary country independent country imaginary in this entire region that's what it is the nagas who are christians do not support the cookies the nagas have fought the cookies in the past this is not this has nothing to do with religion and don't portray this as a hindu christian conflict which is complete which is a complete misrepresentation of what's happening <clears throat> next question Samarth Gandhi says has the media shown the truth about what the cookies want can you explain what exactly is cookie land they are claiming many states of far east as cookie land also why is the media not showing what's happening to the maites why only one side of the story is being shown that's what the indian media does always if you see the reporting in the in the ukraine war they will only show reporting from the western perspective and from ukrainian soil there were two or three indian channels that sent journalists to cover the war they all cover covered the conflict from the ukrainian side of the conflict in ukrainian territory they should have sent two journalists to ukraine and two into russia and cover the thing from both sides so that we understand what's really happening properly but no they will only show one side of the picture this is what the indian media always does and obviously there are agendas behind this 
um, Hindus and the indigenous people have to be shown as the oppressors, the evil majoritarian oppressors, despite the Metis now being a micro minority in their own, you know, ancestral land. So the media doesn't want to show you what's happening to the Metis. They are always portraying the Metis as the aggressors and the cookies as the victims. That's that's what they're showing. They're showing only one side of the story because they are gender driven and uh, I suppose they have foreign funding and foreign masters to whose whose agenda they have to uh, you know cover. Okay, what is the what is Cookie Land? Cookie Land is an imaginary nation. It is a it is a nation that doesn't exist. It is a nation that will never exist. It's a fictitious, fake, imaginary nation. Uh, let me show you what kind of cookie land they want. Okay, they want to cut off India from the Far East, from 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 Southeast Asia. So here is one example of what cookie. This is a this is a tweet from 2019. Okay, join me in the fight for the Christ and cookie land to be a Christian country. It lies in the middle of Indo-Burma, Indo-Bangladesh. It is recorded as cookie country in linguistic survey, whatever, whatever, whatever. And he has tagged Donald Trump and God knows who else. So if you can see the shaded regions of this map, it, it will tell you that they want to take over very large parts of India's Far East and cut off India's access to Southeast Asia. So today you will find, let's go to the map. Okay. Today you will find that India's access to almost the entire world has been cut off. Pakistan and Pakistan-occupied Kashmir cut off India's access to Central Asia and Europe. Chinese-occupied Tibet cuts off India's access to Northern Asia and China. And then what we have left is Southeast Asia, right? But we have never developed the infrastructure and the roads and the railways to access Southeast Asia, even though we have uh, borders with Burma, and through which we can go into Thailand, into Vietnam, Cambodia, all the way to Singapore. We can go all the way to Singapore by road or by rail if we construct the roads and rail. And right now we are, in the Indian government is constructing a road, the Indo-Burma Friendship Road, which passes through More. But More has now been ethnically cleansed by the cookies. There are no Metis who, who survive there. They have been, let's say, eliminated. Uh, there were lots of Tamils, more than 15,000 Tamils who were living in More. Today there are maybe two, 3,000 Tamils left. Where did the rest go? Ask the mate, ask the cookies. So More, which is a critical border city, has now been taken over by the cookies. And they want to take over the entire border regions and create their fictitious fake nation of cookie land, Zalingam, or whatever the hell they want to call it. Yeah. So that is what cookie land is. This is one of the, you know, <coughs> one of the versions of their great aspirations. Fight for the Christ and Cookie Land, a Christian country that will cut off India's access to Southeast Asia. Here is another one. This is an even larger uh, piece of territory they want. They, they seek to, you know, uh, carve out of India and Bangladesh and Burma as well. They want to take territories from three nations: India, Burma, and Bangladesh, and create a fake, fictitious nation, Cookie Land, Zalingam, whatever. Here's another example of that, as you can see, even larger. They have something called the Zomi platform for Burma and India occupied Zoland. You see, over, the, over here in India, they're saying, no, we only want a separate administration from money from the Metis. We cannot live with the Metis. We want a separate administration, a separate state. But they actually want a separate nation. And they call these parts of India, India occupied Zoland, whatever on earth that means. And they have a Twitter account called Cookie Government. Democratic Republic of Cookie Land is a non-violent government of the Cookie Nation formed for restoration and sovereignty of Cookie Land. It shall be a Christian country. Bangladesh, India and Myanmar. So this is their agenda. This is what they want. Their fictitious fake nation of Cookie Land or Zalingam or whatever they call it. A nation that does not exist and a nation that will never exist. If you want a nation, go fight somewhere else. Not a, not an inch of Indian territory will be given to you. Let's make it very clear about that. Uh, Thaudam Cha says, Do you believe that if cookies are to be given separate administration, the next step for them is to ask for an independent cookie chin zo zalingam country? Think about it this way. 
uh, we have something this this issue that uh, the great shri jawaharlal nehru ji the great magnificent prime minister he created this issue for us the kashmir issue right the kashmir conflict he gave away parts of kashmir to pakistan which is pakistan occupied kashmir gilgit, gilgit baltistan the shakskum region which has been given to china that entire issue right and the pakistanis say that kashmir is ours they have been saying this for a very long time today they are in no position to say it anymore because they are so the, because india has gone so far ahead of them but in the past they were like we will take kashmir kashmir hamara hai and all the nonsense and there were lots of indian politicians who were like oh give it to them give kashmir to pakistan let's solve the issue you know if you give kashmir to pakistan hypothetically you know manmohan singh wanted to give away siachen to kashmir to, to pakistan allegedly the thing is if you hypothetically give away kashmir to pakistan do you think pakistan will be, will become india's friend no pakistan will not become india's friend pakistan sees india as the permanent adversary permanent enemy the nation to be destroyed you give them kashmir you give them anything else they will never be satisfied until they destroy you completely right and you cannot give in to the blackmail of violent people you cannot give in to the blackmail of the intolerant the, of, of the ones who do not abide by the law and especially ones who are not indian so similarly if you give these cookies a separate administration alleged so called they will not be satisfied with that they are fighting for an for an imaginary nation called zalingam or zoland or kukiland they want to take parts of burma parts of india large parts of india huge parts of india and parts of bangladesh and create this fake fictitious nation giving them territory is going to only encourage them to push further you do not negotiate with blackmailers and terrorists you do not give in to the intolerant ones you simply don't do that so yeah if you give them separate administration the next step eventually in a few years will be to ask for more and more and more and in india they will say oh we want separate administration but when they go to the us when they go to washington they are claiming that india is oppressing us they were demonstrating outside the white house a couple of months ago and they were saying that narendra modi government is fascist and they are oppressing us and all that so in india they sing a certain tune outside india they sing a very different tune you cannot give in to their demands you simply can't okay sana jawaba angam says how can we deal with poppy cultivation by slash and burning by slashing and burning of forest areas smiley srinu says is this really a fight between the meat and, and the cookies i think the conflict is indirectly between the drug mafia and the central government what are the chances of this prathar dana says is the ban on opium in afghanistan by the taliban does it have some relation with manipur the west is concerned about the ban on opium by the taliban and we see increase in opium farming in east in manipur etc allegedly yeah we're, we're good questions so when the taliban were fighting the us occupiers of afghanistan and the puppet government that the americans had put up in kabul at that time the taliban needed money so they used to rely on opium cultivation uh, and selling the produce wherever it is wherever you had buyers and that's what brought them money right once the taliban took over afghanistan the americans gave away afghanistan to, to the taliban 2021 i have i covered that extensively on the ask abid show once the taliban took over control of afghanistan established their government and settled down they shut down all the poppy cultivation because after all it's a bad thing it's going to be bad for the people drugs are evil drugs are bad drugs destroy lives right so the taliban are pashtun nationalists and they shut down the poppy cultivation more than 99% of the poppy plantations have been destroyed in afghanistan and the americans were unhappy with this there were editorials in various american very prominent american publications criticizing the taliban for shutting down poppy cultivation and coincidentally while the poppy cultivation was been shut down in afghanistan you had this upsurge in poppy cultivation in manipur in large parts of manipur so much of this not all not all but much of it is being done by the kuki infiltrators what they do is they take over large parts of manipur they they you know they destroy forests huge amounts of protected forests are destroyed cut down slash and burn and then they plant poppies there and you know the golden triangle the trijunction of laos laos uh, burma and thailand 
where, which has historically been a hotbed of drug cultivation, especially poppy, opium, and heroin. Heroin is something you synthesize from opium, uh, which comes from poppies. So the Golden Triangle is right next door. And obviously there are drug lords involved in this. And much of the of the cultivation is being done by the cookies, right? And that's what they've been doing in Burma as well. Now, now the Burmese government is cracking down on the cookies because they're fighting the Burmese government. There's a civil war going there. So now all of that has been moved into, much of that has been moved into Manipur. And then the Manipur government was cracking down on this. And this is one of, that's one of the triggers that, you know, set off this, what, what we could call a civil war in Manipur now on May the 3rd this year. So the Meite cookie, it's definitely a fight between the, the cookies and the Meites. The cookies are trying to uh, ethnically cleanse the Meites from even parts of the valley now. They want to take over essentially everything. They want to confine the Meites only to one city, Imphal. Everything else they want to take over. And then they will fight the Nagas too. So it's not just cookies and Meites. There are Nagas too involved. The Nagas are also the victims. The Meites are definitely the victims. And the cookies are the aggressors. And the, the cookies, much of the cocoa pop, poppy cultivation is being done by the cookies. It, it's a huge, massive, lucrative source of income, which allows them to buy sophisticated weapons from God knows where and so on. right? So there are definitely drug lords involved in all that. There is definitely Afghanistan angle. The Afghanistan poppy cultivation was slammed shut by the Taliban. At the same time, somehow, poppy cultivation, there was, a, there was this big upsurge in Manipur. Clearly, there seems to be some kind of hidden hidden connection. What is the hidden connection? One wonders, right? So how can we deal with poppy cultivation by slashing and burning of forest areas? You have to shut down all of these cultivations if necessary by force. It's still happening. The cookies won't give up. You have to shut it down. If they are unwilling to give it up, you have to put them in jail. You have to shut down what's happening. Drugs are bad. Drugs destroy lives. We don't want drug cultivation in India. As simple as that. It has to happen, but the government has to show the political will to do this. Eventually, it will do that, but I wonder how long it will take. Drumil Shah says, "From where does, from where do these cookie terrorists are, are getting their modern weapons, and how much of a role does the church and the U.S. play in this genocide?" Okay, let's talk about the cookie weapons and all that, right? So. What you will see in so on social media and all that is you will see these these videos of cookies with who are you know who are firing at Meite villages from hilltops. Like I showed, they have ring fenced Imphal, but they are present all across the the other parts of Manipur as well. And wherever you have small Meite villages, they are firing with automatic weapons from the hilltops at the at the villages. So the Meites who live in these areas are farmers and they are unable to farm. So all their crops will be lost. And then the, they will have to depend on the central government for assistance because their all the crops will be lost this year. So where are these weapons coming from? You will see these guys, these cookie terrorists with very sophisticated weapons. Very sophisticated weapons. You will see mortars, you will see <coughs> Excuse me, drones that drop grenades, the kind of drones you see in the in the Ukraine conflict, kind of. And you will see very sophisticated uh, assault rifles and whatnot. Where are they getting this from? That's a very good question, right? So uh, we, the cookies clearly have a lot of money from drug cultivation. So if you see Manipur, you will see that uh, the northern part of Manipur, if you if you measure the distance from here to, let's say, Yunnan province of China, it's less than 300 kilometers through hilly through hilly terrain, through difficult hilly and forested terrain. But it's less than 300 kilometers. The Chinese have historically been very willing and very happy to, uh, to help separatists in various parts of India, the northeast of India, far east of India. Uh, they helped various separatists, the Bodo separatists, the Naga separatists, the Meite separatists, everybody, especially the Naga separatists, the Chinese. There are pictures of the various uh, separatist leaders at the Great Wall of China and all that that you can see on the internet, right? So one way of getting these sophisticated weapons is definitely through China. And you will see some Chinese-made assault rifles and all that the cookies have. You will see that in various social media posts and videos. So one possibility 
is China. Uh, the golden triangle is a trijunction of, of uh, Thailand, Myanmar, and Laos, was it, which is this region. And obviously, southern Yunnan is involved in that. So this region where you have so much drug running, drug production, you will have a huge influx. It will be awash with sophisticated weapons because you need sophisticated weapons to, to, to safeguard your drug operations, right? So I'm sure some of some of that is being transferred to, to the cookies in Manipur now. And obviously, Yunnan obviously is nearby. So uh, from there also, you could be uh, having this. The other possibility is Bangladesh, but Bangladesh, the government is fighting the cookies because they are trying to separate, uh, you know, carve out a piece of territory from Bangladesh as well. So definitely not Bangladesh. I I would not think it would come from Bangladesh. Most likely it would come from the Yunnan region of China. How much role does, does the church in America play in this genocide? Well, you know, we don't have information. Do they even play a role? Maybe, may not be. But yeah, the church is more than a religious organization. It's a political organization. It controls the politics of, of uh, these various states that are com- almost completely Christianized, especially Mizoram and Nagaland. The cookies are also all Christian, so definitely you will have some church angle in there. But how much is there, we don't know. So I can't really comment more about that. But yeah. Next question. Okay, two questions. Chain gang soldier NIT. I think AFSPA may be needed to be put in place again, this time to covertly clear out the trash. And S. Passon 3 says, wonder why not imposition of AFSPA and call in army for a limited time. As army, Assam rifles and other special forces like paramilitary forces are not active due to lack of AFSPA. AFSPA. The state government and central have totally failed to access the situation and did not use etc. 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 Lots of death, destruction, and heinous crimes, especially against women and children. The Methi are being blamed completely by Christians, media, Christian nations, Christian ecosystem, giving religious color against the Hindu Methi, as is always being done in India against Hindus on the uh, name of minorities. Okay, all that is fine. The question is about AFSPA, the Armed Forces Special Power Act. Let's take a look at AFSPA. Okay, let's take a look at AFSPA. Uh, I'm going to put a Wikipedia page on the screen. Once again, statutory warning. You cannot trust Wikipedia for everything. I'm just putting it briefly and rapidly for reference, cursory reference. So this is the page for AFSPA. And first of all, let's go to another page, which is, this is from a government website. The Armed Forces Special Power Act, Powers Act, 1958. It starts by saying that violence became a way of life in the northeastern states of India. Well, it was the government of India that was responsible for this happening. Yeah, and then they imposed the, they created this Special Powers Ordinance or Act in 1958 that gives uh, extraordinary powers to the armed forces to act in these disturbed areas. And this is the entire thing. You can take a look at that. Now, <coughs> the question is. Should we have AFSPA in Manipur? By the way, the answer is we already have AFSPA in Manipur. Let's come down here. This may not be entirely accurate, but it gives you a good idea of where AFSPA is. So in Manipur, all of these regions already have AFSPA. Imphal East include excluding like one, two, three police stations. Imphal West exclu- excluding one, two, three, four, five, six, seven police stations. Bishnupur, Thaubal, Jiribam, Kakching, all excluding one police station jurisdiction. So three plus how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three plus ten. Fourteen. Apart from four, 14 police station jurisdictions in Manipur, everything else is under AFSPA. Armed Forces Special Power Act. Everything in Manipur, with the exception of 14 police stations jurisdictions, is already under AFSPA. Imphal, the city, is not under AFSPA. And there is no violence in Imphal. There is no violence in Imphal. There are cookies who live in Imphal and they are safe. There is no violence against them. But the parts of Manipur where you have this rampage of violence, they have AFSPA. And by the way, AFSPA was imposed in Manipur in 1958. Manipur was declared a disturbed state in 1958. And AFSPA was removed finally from some parts of Manipur in 2006. Half a decade of AFSPA in Manipur, which did not solve any problem. What did AFSPA do? What did it do? And today, the parts of Manipur, like I said, where you don't have AFSPA, 
are peaceful. And the parts of Manipur where you have Afspa, they're burning. <coughs> so I don't think Afspa is the solution. You see, you see my point here? I don't think Afspa is the solution. I, I, I I'm sure Afspa can be kept where it already is. But those those regions are where you already have all these disturbances and this terrorism. And AFSPA is doing nothing to curb that. So the solution is not, maybe it's not AFSPA, it's maybe something else. See? Okay, this is a long question. More is part of the Act East policy. It's at, it's at the heart of the Act East policy. It's now completely controlled by the Myanmar-controlled Kuki militants. Understand that the Kuki militants, the Kuki terrorists, are not controlled by the Myanmar government. They are fighting the Myanmar government. This entire terrorism, the Kuki terrorism insurgency in Manipur, it has nothing to do with the government of Myanmar. The Kukis are fighting Myanmar, the government. They're also fighting the Maitis, and they're also fighting Bangladesh. So it is completely incorrect to blame the government of Myanmar for what's happening. They themselves are trying to fight the Kukis. See, uh, okay, co- continuing, the government of India has completely failed Manipur in tackling the crisis. The center, uh, all that, yeah, all right. Afspa has called cause untold miseries to the Maitis in Manipur started developing after Afspa was lifted in the valley areas. After the Maitri riots, there's no violence inside the, inside the Afspa free in Fal Valley region. But there is continuous terrorist activities uh, unleashed by illegal Koki militants who ironically live in the Afspa areas. Exactly. Exactly what I said. Wherever you don't have Afspa, you have peace right now. And wherever you have Afspa, you have terrorism. So that's the deal. Afspa is, is not going to prevent What's happening? You have Afspa where the cookies are doing whatever they're doing. It's not stopping them from doing what they're doing. It's not stopping them. Afspa. Uh, More is, is at the heart of the Act East policy. Let's take a look at More. More is an extremely important, uh, strategically located town for India. It was supposed to be India's gateway to Southeast Asia. More and Tamu. So on, on one side of the India-Myanmar border, we have More. On the other side, we have Tamu. And More was home to, well, historically, it's been home to Maitis. And you also had Tamils. You also had Gorkhas to some extent. The Maitis have been totally eliminated from, from More in the past two months only. And out of 15,000 Tamils, maybe 2,000 or so may be left in More. This is what the cookies have done. The cookies have essentially taken control of More. The government of India, I don't know if it even exists in More anymore. But our strategic road the Indo-Burma friendship road, it goes through More. And uh, yeah, so that's that's a disaster for India as far as we are concerned. It's it's at the heart of India's Act East, Act East policy. Uh, so in the future, when India develops, finally, after a million years, road and rail links with Southeast Asia, <coughs> excuse me, with Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Malaysia, all the way to Singapore, it will all pass through Manipur, it will all pass through More. More will be one of the central, uh, you know, it, it will be at the heart of this activist policy. And right now it's controlled by these foreign, illegal, infiltrator, alien terrorists. It's a disaster. So this is completely, This uh, I agree, this is a failure of the government of India. This should not have happened. They should have seen this coming. But yeah, here we are. Sana Jauba Angam says, what are some ge- what is the geopolitical angle in the present chaos in Manipur? And Manipur United says, what does the current Manipur crisis have to do with world geopolitics, including Myanmar, junta and pro-democracy groups, and Western forces? Why is Indian defense not neutralizing the Chen militants occupying Manipur? Geopolitics is always at the heart of the matter in things like these. So let's once again take a look at the map. See, the U.S. wants to use India to counterbalance China. China is the big enemy for the U.S. right now. The U.S. doesn't want India to become too powerful either. Because then, if once China is dealt with, India will be the big competitor. So they want to use India as a counterweight to China, but they don't want India to rise too much. So how do you prevent India from rising too much? By creating all kinds of problems in India's periphery. So one example is that the Americans are strongly against the current Bangladesh government, the Sheikh Hasina government, which they perceive as being too strongly pro-India. They don't want a pro-India government in Bangladesh. It is none of that business, but they are trying to uh, effect a regime change in Bangladesh in the next election. That's what the Americans are trying to do. Secondly, Myanmar, 
the Americans have imposed a whole host of sanctions on Myanmar after the Aung San Suu Kyi government was deposed in the 2021 coup by the Burmese military. Uh, and the Americans perceive Burma, Myanmar, as becoming kind of pro-China and they don't want that. So they are, that's why they have imposed sanctions, but that actually has taken away all the leverage the Americans have on Burma. Now, the, the Burmese government is facing terrorism and insurgency from the cookies in Chin state. So if the Americans don't like the Burmese government, and if the cookies are fighting the Burmese government, it makes sense for the Americans to like and to support the cookies. You see, that is the logic of strategy. That is simple. That's a simple mathematical thing. My enemy's enemy is my friend, that sort of thing. The Americans are also trying to create trouble in Thailand, right? So uh, if you remember, in case you noticed, in 2020, 2021, there were these spontaneous pro-democracy protests in Thailand. You know, green-haired, purple-haired, pink-haired students were protesting for democracy. They were saying, down with the monarchy of Thailand, down with the king, down with the Chakri dynasty, down with King Rama. That is something the Americans obviously were doing. This is the standard color revolution playbook. Apparently, spontaneous protests emerge out of nowhere. And they also disappear out of uh, into nowhere. Protests never happen spontaneously. They have to be coordinated. You need leadership behind that. You need, you need coordination, you need leadership, you need funding and all that. It never happens spontaneously. No political parties appear spontaneously out of thin air. So the Americans clearly are behind the Thai protests, which happened in 2020-21. And right now, they were trying to, uh, you know, position an, an aspiring Zelensky as the Prime Minister of Thailand. His name is Pita Limja Roy Nath. Uh, let's try and search for that gentleman. Pita Limja Norat. He's, he's uh, an aspiring Zelensky pro-US politician who the Americans were trying to position and, and install as the Prime Minister of Thailand, they have failed. Okay, So that's the kind of game the Americans are known to be playing in, in our vicinity, in India's neighborhood. So the Americans are involved in Burma. They, they are opposed to the Burmese government. They are trying to uh, effect a regime change in Bangladesh. They are trying to effect a regime change in Thailand. They are again supporting Pakistan. You know, Pakistan is once again a vassal of the US and, and so on. So and so you will see that India is essentially encircled by, by all these countries where the Americans have something or the other going on. Uh, so since the Americans are against the Burmese government and since the cookies are fighting the Burmese government, it makes sense that the Americans are pro-cookie. And you will see the U.S. Institute for Peace and so on. One second. U.S. Institute for Peace. U.S. Institute for Peace. Okay, let's put that on the screen. That, the U.S. Institute for Peace. So this is an American federal government institution tasked with promoting conflict resolution and prevention worldwide. Let's take a look at the Twitter handle. So this is the Twitter handle. Let's go to media. It won't allow me to see. Okay, let's go back and let's go to the website. Let's uh, uh, balancing, balancing act. So they have been writing about various things. NATO's balancing act, Burma's balancing act. Time is running out for India's balancing act on the Myanmar border. Uh, and, and if you read these articles in detail, you will say that the, the Americans have a lot of assets on the ground, not only in Burma, but also in, in Mizoram and Manipur. Essentially, they are all cookie, cookies, right? Uh, yeah. So the cookies, they, they have cookie assets in Burma and in India. There is this person called Zo Tum Hmung who has written this article. Now, if you look at... Uh, if you if you go deeper into the rabbit hole, you will see this person's connections to various so-called Indian intellectuals and all that. So the Americans have their hands in deep into this. Understand that, okay? Now, um, the other geopolitical thing is is the drug angle. 
so you have the drug angle and wonder we, we one wonders who is controlling that as well clearly the burmese government is not control in the past they must have been involved in the drug thing but right now the cookies are doing it so so it's it's a mess you know so it's about destabilizing india's far east it's about keeping india off balance it's about creating problems in india so that india is never stable and secure it's about making the current government the current modi government look weak and look ineffective so that it will affect the 2024 election result all these things are part of what's going on right now so this is the geopolitical angle and it's it's pretty well it's it's likely that the us and other maybe china also and other powers also may have a various levels of involvement in all this wave of says you said there is a us involvement in the manipur crisis i did i said there could possibly be a us involvement i did not say there is please please <coughs> please learn to listen properly i said there could possibly perhaps be some kind of involvement of the us in the manipur crisis right that's what i said please don't misrepresent what i said okay so even though it's more beneficial for china why does the us help china indirectly remember in papua new guinea when prime minister modi was supposed to go and have this uh, pacific island nation summit the americans got in the way remember that a few months ago they they got in the way they tried to uh, to sabotage india's initiative and that would benefit china the americans don't want india to rise too much and they will help out china to, in small ways if it also counterbalances india so you know that's what they do <coughs> so they are okay with helping china indirectly in some small ways but overall they want india to counterbalance china in a big way it's it's complicated but yeah there could be possibly a us involvement like i just explained in the manipur crisis chandram kutta says what has prime minister modi done in the last 9 years to fix the problem would you please enlighten us about it instead of blaming the past governments listen when when i give you context it is not blaming the past governments facts are facts facts don't care about my feelings or your feelings or anyone's feelings i have clearly shown in this live stream itself how the problem started it starts with the british forcing the manipur king to accept illegal burmese immigrants you know settlers troublemakers it starts with that then you have the christianization which happens first before independence with the british then with the americans american missionaries after independence then you have the complete neglect and marginalization of the northeast which causes all these insurgencies and you have the continuous indian government's settlement of kuki refugees into manipur i showed you evidence of that so clearly the problem was created in the 20th century by the then indian governments and now in the last 10 9 years mr modi has come to power so it's all his fault think logically i am not saying the government has not failed right now the modi government has failed in the last two months they should have seen this coming this is a failure on many levels they should have seen this coming and they have failed but let's also look at what mr modi and his government have done they came to power in manipur in 2017 at that time manipur was a disaster zone it had seen more than 5 decades of insurgency 4 pm in the evening when the sun goes down in the far east of india there would be curfew automatically every single day everybody would be off the roads right there would be bomb blasts everywhere in manipur on a routine basis there would be firing and gunfights between various insurgent groups in manipur this was happening on a day to day basis even in the city of imphal itself until 2016 2017 that's that was the condition in manipur after the bjp came to power they completely turned around the fortune of the state okay by 2018 2019 there was nightlife in manipur people would go out at night restaurants and businesses and hotels opened up in the last 5 years manipur was completely transformed it had started booming as an economy people were making money businesses were operating people who had left manipur out of desperation started returning to manipur hotels opened up tourism started booming aerosports initiatives started taking off 
people and businesses were earning crores and crores of money. That's what happened in Manipur in the past five years. But this problem was simmering in the background. And the government should see, have seen this coming. The government totally transformed Manipur in the past five years, from 2017 until 2023. It was a huge transformation, very positive transformation. You could see this great energy in the state and great optimism. And then May 3rd onwards, we have seen this sudden spontaneous outbreak of violence that has pushed back Manipur two or three decades. Manipur has now gone back to the bad days of the 1990s and 1980s, maybe even worse. So Manipur has been ruined. And the Narendra Modi government should have seen this coming. And clearly they have failed. So I'm not saying they have not failed. But we also have to understand where the pro- how the problem was created. It wasn't Mr. Modi and his government who created the problem. They inherited the problem. And they have not done a very good job. They, they had good intentions for Manipur. Manipur was doing so well in the past 5-6 years. They did what, you know, they, 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 did, they did a lot for Manipur. But now, everything has been ruined. And they need to fix it. Vedant says, what do you think about the future of the Northeast in Manipur? Is it possible that India can lose its integral part because of illegal immigration, Ill- illegal immigrants and forced mass, mass conversions? Sanatani Vandirovan says, will we lose the far eastern part of India? I don't think we will lose it uh, territorially. But yes, the conversions are still happening and the people are becoming alienated from their roots, from their culture and from India. This is something the Chinese have seen in the 19th century. This is something the Japanese have written about. The samurai wrote about this. When you convert somebody to a foreign religion, they lose their roots and their allegiance to their ancestral culture. And then they, in some cases, become anti-national. That's what the Chinese and the Japanese have written. So, Mass conversion, massive industrial scale demographic religious uh, conversion is an imperialistic and neo-colonialistic ploy and it has political agendas and, and, and motives. And this is something that's happening. So uh, even we, we will definitely not lose this region territorially. But yes, we, we could lose the hearts and minds of the people if they if they all, you know, lose their 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 connection with India. A hundred years ago, all the Nagas still practiced their ancestral culture. Most of them, most of the Mizos practice their ancestral culture, polytheistic culture. Today, they're all totally different. So this is something that we have allowed to happen. It's something that Mr. Nehru facilitated. And that is his great legacy. We won't lose the Far East of India, but it's going to be a long hole for us to reintegrate this region into the rest of India properly. Neeraj Mulchandani says, clearly there is an external hand in this issue from the Myanmar end. How hard is it for the Indian Army to repeat the 2015 Myanmar insurgency operation or Operation Hot Pursuit on the insurgent camps and shut this matter out completely? You know, the Indian Army, you give them the order, if the government gives them the order, they can solve the entire matter in a matter of three to seven days. But they have rules of engagement. They are given rules of engagement, you cannot do certain things, you cannot cross certain lines, you can only do these things. And that's why even though all this is happening there, they are forced to sit and watch. The the Indian Army is a very high quality, top quality professional uh, fighting force. They can deal with this issue in in, in short short notice. They can, you know, solve the problems. They can uh, take out all the terrorist camps within Burma or wherever it is. You think the Burmese government can stop the Indian army from doing that? If, if we have to, we can do it. We can get everything done quickly. Uh, so it's not hard for the Indian army to do that. But if India crosses the border and und- undertakes a large-scale operation that lasts, let's say, three days or five days in on the territory of a neighboring country, the entire world will jump on the opportunity to label India as an expansionist power evil power. Same as China. You know, that's what they will do. So that's why it doesn't make sense for us to do it right now. Unfortunately, the root cause of the problem is in Burma, Chin state. That's where all the trouble is coming from. But right now we can't do anything 
about that for now at least. Truth, truth shall prevail. 883 says, Kobru Hills and Thangjing are where the original Mete tribes came down from the valley to the valley in ancient times. I think out of the seven clans, one clan came down from these hills and settled in the valley and later from the Manipur as we know today. That's the reason why these hill areas are considered as sacred places where our ancestral divinity resides. And these places have all been desecrated today. Yes, the Kobru, Kobru Hill. So for the rest of us who are not from the Northeast, think of it like this. How holy is Kailash, Mount Kailash for us? It's one of the holiest sites in our culture and civilization. It's currently in foreign uh, possession. It's, it's, it's located in Tibet, which is currently occupied by the Chinese. So Mount Kailash, one of our greatest, holiest, most sacred sites, is under Chinese occupation right now. But they have not. the Chinese have not desecrated Kailash. They don't any, allow anybody to climb the mountain and they keep everybody off limits. They even allow people to go on pilgrimages and circumambulate the mountain. So the Chinese are not desecrating the mountain. Now think about something as holy as that from the perspective of the people of Manipur, the Maitais. For them, one of the holiest places is Mount Kobru. Let's let's found let's find it. Let's locate it. It's northwest of Imphal. Somewhere over here. Okay. Let's search for it. Mount Ko Kobru. Yeah. So it's somewhere here. Okay, let's let's take a look at this mountain. So this mountain is one of the holiest and most sacred sites for the Maitis, the Manipuris, the Manipuri Hindus. And it's it's kind of the birthplace of, of Manipur as a, as a culture, as a civilization. And this mountain, as you can see, it is kind of becoming balder and balder. It's losing its, its forest cover. It's because the cookies are now occupying this place and they are cutting down all the forests, the sacred forests, and they are growing poppies there drug cultivation and you will see over here there's supposed to be a temple over here right a shrine well do you see any shrine here there is no shrine here anymore the shrine has been destroyed guess who did that so this sacred place is now off limits to the metes it has been destroyed and desecrated and that's what that's the kind of cultural genocide that's being done by the cookies to the metes in manipur that's that's the status of the indigenous people in India today. Okay, next. Boycott something, 2779 says, the situation in Tripura is also not good. The indigenous community are not getting any benefits from the government of India and the state plus, and the state, and there is infiltration of illegal, illegal Bangladeshis and there is demographic change. Paul Shania says, the same situation will also prevail in Assam if the illegal immigration of of Bangladesh is, is kept unchecked. I'm from Assam. It's seen here that most of the lands are occupied by these people, most of whom have no NRCs, even who are not citizens, clearly, who are illegal infiltrators. The previous government failed immensely to stop the illegal immigration, and the same with the current government, even though some steps are being taken. The system has too many loopholes. I don't want to see my Assam the way like Manipur. You will see the situation across the far east of India, whether it is Tripura, whether it is Assam. Demographic re-engineering through massive illegal infiltration, whether it is Bangladeshis, whether it is Rohingyas or whoever else. The government of India needs to find a way to solve the problem. We need to find a way to solve this issue. India is not something that's free for all. Everybody come in. It's a dharamshala. Everybody come in and take our territories and we will give you special rights and, and, and privileges and we will and you we will allow you to oppress the true indigenous Indian citizens. How can we have such standards in India? It is high time that enough is enough and something is done about this. You are seeing a disaster unfolding right now in real time in Manipur. The same thing could happen very soon in Assam, in, in Tripura. Where are the Tripuris today? The indigenous people of Tripura are the Tripuris. How many of them even exist anymore? The place has been totally demographically re-engineered after 1971, which was when you had the Bangladeshi Hindus who had to escape from Bangladesh, the genocide done by the Pakistanis, and who came into Bengal and Tripura. And many of them settled down there. But they were Hindus. But now you have the Bangladeshis who are coming in enormous numbers. The borders are open. Tell me something. 
which which government agency is in charge of safeguarding india's borders in the east in bangladesh in bangladesh border it's the border security force the bsf have they done a good job of in carrying out the duty the bsf by the way is not the indian army it is not the indian army the indian army is one of the world's most professional and high quality military forces their standards are unimpeachable when it comes to the bsf or the crpf or the assam rifles these are central police forces these are paramilitary forces they are not the indian army they are cops who wear army kind of uniforms and who have automatic rifles and some uh, weapons that typically cops don't have but these are paramilitary forces these are central police forces the bsf is one of them and the bsf i am sorry to say have done a terrible job of preventing illegal immigration infiltration by the bangladeshis they have completely failed at that and in the past i can show you media news reports on times of india and wherever else of bsf officers being being arrested because they were facilitating Ill- illegal infiltration into india so these problems the government has to look into the bsf comes under the central government the assam rifles comes under the central government the assam rifles is in charge of border security in manipur and i showed you a document by the government of manipur in which they have asked the assam rifles for uh, they have asked you know the assam rifles why they allowed 718 uh illegal burmese aliens cookies to come into india on the 23rd of may or 23rd of july why this is what's happening the central government needs to crack down on the on the functioning of all these security forces paramilitary forces who are tasked with safeguarding india's border security and who are failing in their job it's it's terrible it's it's very very disappointing that this is happening so the same situation exists across the far east of india the northeast of india Manipur is a disaster zone now. Assam, we know what's happening there. Tripura, ah, the Tripuris hardly exist anymore. You know, they've lost their own ancestral territory. It's a whole other disaster. But at least we don't have ethnic cleansing and terrorism in Tripura right now. Manipur, you have it openly right now. So that's the situation. Okay, next. Sana Jawa Angam says, "What can be the way forward for Manipur?" the simple thing is we need to do an nrc and get rid of all the aliens and we need to have a proper cut off date for the nrc so it cannot be let's compromise and let's keep the cut off date at 2001 or maybe 1991 no manipur became a part of the union union of india in 1949 if there is any justice in the world the cut off date for the nrc should be 1949 or at the la- at the latest at the most 1951 and anybody who is in manipur especially the the burmese origin people they should be able to prove that they or their ancestors were living in manipur before 1949 or 1951 whichever date we take they have to be able to show evidence of that if they can't show evidence they have to be deported back to their homeland in chin state where they can fight for an imaginary country it's not our problem in india everybody's problem is not our problem so the way forward is a proper nrc and it should be done properly if just because somebody has an aadhar card doesn't mean that they are an, an indian citizen and just because a burmese origin person has an indian passport doesn't mean that they should be included as a citizen we have to go back and dig deep into their antecedents you're getting aadhar cards at 8000 rupees a piece now once you have an aadhar card you can get a passport so that is not the way to do things the nrc in assam was a was a mess if i recall correctly it did not go well the more natives were were listed as foreigners than than infiltrators the infiltrators all had the documents and the natives did not have the documents in assam so that's not the way to do an nrc you leave it to the bureaucrats they're going to mess everything up it has to be done properly so the way forward is either so nrc has to be done foreigners have to be ejected from burma from from manipur that's the only way you will have justice you can either give in to the blackmail and the violence of the of the of the of the intolerant oppressor or you have justice and you give justice to the natives by ejecting the the illegals you cannot give in to violence you cannot give in to blackmail you do it once you will embolden these guys and they will want more and more so the way forward is nrc get rid of all the aliens and then if required fence the border it will take maybe a few years do it or uh, 
you know, maybe conduct a military operation in the Chin state and get, uh, you know, and, and neutralize all the terrorists. That could be another thing which we could perhaps do uh, in cooperation with the Burmese government. That's where the problem is coming from, from Chin state. So these are some of the things we could do. But right now, Manipur is ruined. The BJP government took Manipur forward a great deal from 2017 to 2023. But in the past two and a half months, Manipur has gone backwards two or three decades. And whatever damage has been done, it is not just a hundred or maybe thousands of crores of rupees, maybe lakhs of crores of rupees, not just that. Entire businesses have been ruined, entire crops have been destroyed, and the entire state has been pushed back by several decades. And uh, it's going to take at least a decade to undo the damage. So the government has failed. There are no two ways about it. The government has failed. It's very disappointing. And they need to find the solution ASAP as soon as possible. So I think that's that's all I had with the questions. I, I had lots of other questions, but I took 25 and I think I've answered them all. Now let's see if we have any uh, questions in the live chat. I can take maybe two or three questions from the live chat. Uh, so in case you have questions which I have not taken, which I have not taken today, uh, ask them in the live chat and I'll take maybe two or three of these. And the questions have to be about Manipur, not other things. All right. Today is Manipur. Uh, I have answered this question. I have answered this question. Uh, I'm not taking ISRO or DRDO today. Uh, okay, do we have any interesting questions that I've not taken today? People are asking questions about something else. Reina the Reina, Queen of Queens, says, Locals in Imphal West, Kang Kangla Tongbi village, witnessed a strange bright light hovering high up in the sky between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. on September 18. I suppose the cookies have UFOs now, flying saucers. Or maybe the Americans are involved. What can I say? Uh, uh, Keshav says, why are some SOO groups, which means cookie terrorist groups, so beloved to the Ministry of Home Affairs that the state straight up rejected Manipur state government's appeal to revoke the SOO? I, listen, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what the government is doing. And what the logic is, the Manipur state government, obviously, we know that they wanted to revoke the SOO, the suspension of operation uh, agreement. But looks like the central government has not gone ahead with that. I don't know what the calculations are and all that. Obviously, I, I, I still trust the government of India. I, I know that they prioritize the national interest about everything. But sometimes the national interest takes a few years to fructify. So I don't know what it is. But yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, Sabana, I have answered this for two hours. <laughs> uh, you can look look back at the live stream and, you know, I, I have answered all this. Okay, what next? Okay, Vault Gaming says, Pourquoi le BSF, BSF, Indien est si inutile? Why is the Indian BSF so useless? Yeah, well, that's something the central government needs to look into. It comes under the central government. The BSF has totally failed in curbing any kind of illegal infiltration from Bangladesh. We have lakhs, maybe millions of illegal Bangladeshi infiltrators all across India. And it was, the, it was the BSF's job to stop them. And they have failed. So I don't know why they are so useless, but they are. And it is something for the central government to fix. And thus far, nothing has been done. It's frustrating and it, deeply disappointing. Will the Maithis survive? The Maithis will survive. They have been around for thousands of years and they will be around for a few thousand years, more at least. It's a bad time. Everybody understands. But you got to be strong. And you got to, well, do what it takes. Am I, am I learning French? No, I learned French a long, 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 long time ago. Okay. <laughs> which uh, what will happen to politics in Manipur now? Which party will come to power? So I think the people of Manipur, especially the Metis, are extremely disenchanted and disillusioned with the BJP government. It's possible that the Congress may come to power next time. It, it, it's possible. I'm not saying it will, but possible. And please remember who created the Manipur problem in the first place. I would, I would, uh, I would encourage the people of Manipur 
to look at history and understand who created this problem in the, in the first place. Was it the BJP or was it the Congress? Then vote wisely. I know the BJP government has done a, made a mess of things, but the problem was not of their making. And maybe it was too big for them to solve right now. Maybe it will take a decade to solve. They will solve it. But it's going to take time. Uh, why? How, how are the cookies getting so much media favor? Well, they belong to a special religion. They come from outside. They get special privileges. Right? So obviously the media will favor them. That's how it is. That's unfortunately how it is. Rabina Thangjam says, is there any land for cookies in the world? Listen, it's not my problem whether they have any land for themselves or not. The cookies are not my people. They are not Indians. They, whether they have land or not is not India's problem. So they have Chin State where they live and they are trying. They are fighting the government there. Why? I don't know. They have a land which is Chin State in Burma. Okay, let's, let's once again go there. Chin State Okay, Chin State. This huge piece of territory is where these cookies live. So why do they want more and more territory? So they are behaving exactly like the People's Republic of China. That's the same attitude that they have. They already have this land, but they're not satisfied. They want more and more. They want huge chunks of India. They want to cut off the entire Far East of India from Southeast Asia. And they also want pieces of Bangladesh. That's how much territory they want for themselves. I have no sympathy for people who are rapacious, expansionist, and who want to steal other people's land and, and do whatever they've been doing. Okay. Are we done? Uh, Nimish Avasti says, even Maite will not be able to show proofs of having lived in Manipur before 1949. I would say that the Maite should not be required to show proofs. Everyone knows. The historical record is very clear. The Maites are the original people of Manipur. Maite should not be required to show proof. Only the Burmese origin people should be required to, to show proof. Nagas and Maites should not be required to show proof of having stayed in Manipur before 1949. Only the Burmese should be required to show proof if there is any justice. All right. Okay, I think I'm done for today. I hope it was it it, it was informative. It, it hopefully it showed maybe maybe clarify the situation a little bit a little bit more. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna end this live stream now. It's already crossed two hours, well past two hours. So thank you very much, all of you, for all your questions, and uh, I will see you soon, hopefully in the next live stream. Until then, take care, and like I always say, keep raising your standards. Thank you very much. Good day, good night, wherever you are. And I'll see you soon. Bye.